So hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. This is scanning up is hard to do, the threat modeling cover. And this time, we are two. Uh, myself, currently the lead product security architect at Autodesk, previously from uh, Dell EMC, previously from a bunch of other places. And uh, the person that actually thought about this thing called the uh, continuous threat modeling methodology that uh, later became the Autodesk CTM. And uh, together with me, we have Allison, who is actually the person who is uh, leading the implementation of uh, CTM at Autodesk. And uh, we want to talk to you about uh, what we did and how we did it. But before we get there, what kind of title is that? So funny thing about these conferences is that in the process of uh, creating them, you get to uh, discuss what you're going to talk about with a lot of uh, very smart people. And sometimes you'll get some feedback. And apparently, someone, I'm not naming names or pointing fingers, <laughs> decided that the name of the, of the presentation was a bit too uh, obscure. So if you guys don't take anything from this uh, presentation, at least you're going to go out of it with an earworm. But actually, there's another reason why that, that song uh, uh, made sense to me. And uh, the things that one of the, as you're going to see in more details, one of the things that we're trying to do is to separate the whole thing of threat modeling from, uh, from the product team themselves. And to me, sometimes, speaking about threat modeling with uh, uh, developers, feels a bit like, uh, you know, two teenagers when they finish talking on the phone and they start doing the who's going to, to close first. You do it, no, you do it, no, you do it, no, you do it. And with threat modeling, it ends up being the same thing. They come to me and say, we need a threat model. You do it, no, you do it, no, you do it. And at the end, you have to figure out how you're going to work together. So um, I'm going to start with a small intro introduction, explaining what the whole thing is about. And then uh, Alison is going to pick it up and talk about uh, how we did it at Autodesk and the results and the problems and the probable solutions that we have that we think are going to take us forward. So before we go there, uh, let's talk trilogies, okay? Good things come in trees. And I think that we have some very popular examples of two things that should have stayed in trees, but went forward and shouldn't, but let's not go there. So about two years ago, I came to AppSec uh, uh, Cali and I talk, talk, talked about the best flaw didn't make into production. And it was basically a big rant. I was talking about this big beef that I have. Where, where were you people before? Uh, I was talking about this big beef that I have with training and how we do security training and what we call security training and what our expectations from security training were. And uh, basically I said we're doing it wrong and here's an idea of how to do it differently. And from that idea, uh, the whole point of going back to fundamentals came, came true. And uh, at the time, I was freshly out of uh, uh, Dell EMC, where I had the opportunity of playing a bit with one specific product team and trying to get them to do way, things in a different way. And uh, I got to Autodesk, and I was fortunate enough that uh, the security leadership in there, uh, Rini and, and Tony, were, I think, extremely uh, brave in telling me, you know what, why don't you get this idea and try to run with it and let's, let's see if it works. And it's been going on. So a year later I came in here and I said, well, I have this methodology, we are putting it in place, it's called Threat Model Every Story. And uh, I showed how we did it at Autodesk and we managed to actually put all the, the material that we created, both the methodology and the supporting material, we managed to put it in uh, GitHub and it's available for you guys. It's going to be on our reference slide at the end. And I'll say it again, but uh, we gladly accept uh, PRs, suggestions, requests, asks. So if you guys take a look at it and you think that you saw something that needs to be fixed, by all means, do reach out, let us know. Uh, we all get better by, by talking more about this stuff. Now, this year, today, I come to close the trilogy and I swear there will be no fourth part of the trilogy by telling you guys, well, what happened when we actually put this in place? What are the uh, second order consequences that we didn't think about in the beginning? 
uh, what actually came out well and what could be improved. So the big question here, the big idea here was why put this in place? Why create a new methodology at all? There, there are so many threat modeling methodologies out there. Like, looks like every week we find a new one. But the, the biggest problem here was that uh, the thing that was in place was basically throwing the product over uh, a virtual wall between the product team and uh, the security team and telling the security team, here, here's the product. Threat model it for me and bring me back a threat model. Many things that go over a wall do not land well. And this was the case of, of uh, these threat models. They would go over the wall, get done, come back, and look a bit uh, formulaic, look a bit cookie cutter. The, uh, the nuances of the product would be lost because the product team knows a lot about the product that the security team would never do. And uh, it just doesn't scale well. I mean, Autodesk has 250 products. Having one team, a small team at the time, doing all the threat models at the same time would never work. <laughs> so at this time, I think that I'm going to pass it to Alison so that she can tell us how we did it and what we did. Great, thank you. So just to let you all know uh, what the problem was specifically that we were having with having to scale. Um, we were looking at threat models for a small subset of our 200 dev teams at Autodesk. And um, this was around 30 or so threat models that were completed um, and that we could find records of. Um, and they were not super detailed and they were done in some cases with an automated tool. Um, so we actually didn't know if these were true positive findings and if these findings, if true positives, would be relevant to the system as it stands today. So we have all these products, all this unknown attack surface. We even don't know about the threat models that we do have and we have a dire need to scale and fast. So uh, our proposal was that we can't do it alone and we can't hire our way out of every problem. So we're going to scale by bringing education and the knowledge of threat modeling to development teams. And uh, the type of method that we wanted to use is a continuous threat modeling method. So uh, on the left here, you have traditional threat modeling uh, with a spike in the beginning uh, in the design phase, and then not much going on in between and a spike at the end uh, right before release. So you're having another threat model, you have another set of findings, and you can't do much about it right before release. Uh, so we wanted to do things very differently and actually continuously threat model along with the product as it evolves through the software development lifecycle and make sure that we're not having that big pile of attack surface at the end still when we're about to release. So um, why are we creating a new method? Uh, and then what are the key features of our method? We have a lack of dependency on predefined lists. So we're not looking at a set of uh, findings and then seeing if that applies to each system. Uh, this is something that is iterative and educational. And there's also a focus on secure development principles um, so that we can educate developers and share that knowledge so that we're not doing this alone. Uh, this is also built to support agile uh, development and integrate with the development processes of each team. And uh, finally, by doing this, we enable self-sufficient threat modeling that is continuous. So uh, let's take an overview of the method. Um, we have required baseline reviews of threat models uh, annually and with major changes in the product's design. Um, after the baseline review of a threat model, the development team begins to perform uh, continuous threat modeling using the CTM checklist. And this is really important that 
uh, bug tickets come out of both halves of the method, both the baseline threat model and the continuous process. So now that we know the overview, what are the roles? So the stakeholders uh, are practically everyone involved in development. Uh, so practically everyone on the development team. Uh, one of the members of the team is going to be the threat model curator. So they're going to be responsible for keeping the threat model current uh, with the system as it evolves so that we avoid that pile at the end uh, that we can't address in a short time before release. Uh, we're also going to bring in the security team when needed. Uh, we don't want to hang over teams and be involved in every part of the process. We're there if teams need us. Um, for the rest of the engineering team, uh, they're responsible for performing continuous threat modeling on every development story. Um, they provide input on the system and point out potential security gaps. Um, the thing that's unique about the developers and bringing them in is that they have technology specific and product specific knowledge that is very hard for the the security team to gain quickly, especially for 200 dev teams. So those are really important benefits to bringing dev teams into threat modeling. And for AppSec, we're here to guide engineering teams. And uh, the purpose of having all of these different roles involved is that we create what's called aha moments. So these can be uncomfortable at first, but we see a strong benefit to having people discuss their own system from different perspectives and the different roles that they have. So an architect might discuss with a developer, uh, hey, that authentication between component A and component B, uh, where is it in the DFD? I don't see it. And the developer might say, actually, we didn't have time to implement that, so it's not there. This is a pretty extreme example, but I mean, I'm sure all of us have seen pretty hairy things in the industry. So we want everyone to be on the same page about what's there and the uh, findings that are there so that we can deal with them and work on remediation and not, I have the right view of the system, well, I don't. So let's just put it all in a document, get people to talk, and uh, get through these aha moments to have a more complete picture of our system. So how does it actually work? Now that we know who does what, what is the actual process of continuous threat modeling? So the developer labels security relevant user stories in their queue, and they use the CTM checklist to determine whether that user story passes the security sniff test, as we call it. So this is something that the developer is going to do on their own using the suggested questions and best practices that are included in the CTM checklist. And they're going to decide if that ticket has security features that are needed for that user story to be implemented as is. And if so, they continue work on the ticket as usual. If that ticket does not pass the security sniff test, the developer will note down potential security gaps in that ticket. And then they're going to discuss with other members of the team and the curator to decide if a design change is needed. And if so, they can just rewrite that user story and implement a more secure uh, ticket. And if in that discussion, they actually find out that there are findings on an existing feature within the product, then they would note that in a finding. Um, and that's tracked with the bug tracking tool. Finally, the curator notes any changes that have happened to the architecture of the product in the baseline threat model document. So that document is actually keeping current with the system as it changes. So now that we know what people do and the process, let's look at some results. What are our numbers to back up this big transition? So previously, thinking of threat modeling as a service, uh, we have about 31 threat models completed over the past five or so years. 
This was done by one team, application security, and there were a lot of false positives. In contrast, the Autodesk CTM method produced 283 baseline threat models, and we currently have 18 teams using the CTM checklist to do continuous threat modeling on their own. And we've come out with over 1,000 findings. And just to drill down into what we're actually getting with the Autodesk CTM method, previously we would have automated tool-based threat models coming out with over 300 findings per threat model. Now we have uh, for the same application an example of 13 high-value actionable findings. So that's a big change. I don't know about you, but I would really much rather have 13 findings to deal with than 300. So what are some of our challenges? It wasn't always sunshine and rainbows going through this big transition of transferring responsibility to dev teams and uh, educating so many people with such a small team to support that process. One thing that we had difficulty with uh, was that the baseline review that we're providing took a long time. And we were taking, in some cases, over a week or two weeks to review one ticket alongside other work that we're doing. And um, it's kind of confusing. Why would an expert take so long? But we found that this was due to a common perfectionist mindset on our team. And all we needed was Izar here to come and give us a pep talk. So he helped us reorient the team to having a mindset that failing is perfectly OK, and experts even make mistakes sometimes. In that way, we could focus on having less detail but more baseline in our reviews. We want to get all of the low-hanging fruit and make sure that there are no glaring issues before passing the review. We also worked on rating products by their impact for review, and this was another idea from Izar. Um, we selected high impact products for deeper reviews, and then uh, lower impact products got a quick review focusing on the major suspects or selected areas. Another challenge that we had, if I could get it to go forward, OK, is constant process education. So with this big change, there were understandably a lot of questions from dev teams. And folks were wondering um, things like, hey, is internal threat a real thing? And we're like, no, the firewall is not your magic castle. Um, this is a real thing. So it was hard to get folks on the right page with uh, looking at findings that are relevant and uh, that other tools cannot find. Uh, some teams fell back to using popular methodologies like Stride, and we had to re-educate them on how to use the Autodesk method. Another common issue was that subject areas in the baseline threat model handbook are not checklists. So we have starter questions, but that's not the end game. We want to go forward and use these questions as an educational starting point. So what did we do? Uh, we worked on scaling our support with the Threat Modeling Ambassador Program. So this came out of a review done with Izar, and uh, it was uh, the idea of a developer to volunteer their time to help other development teams to actually improve their threat modeling uh, know-how. So this is something that is currently under design with one operating alpha site. And basically the idea is that that member of the development team who has volunteered is going to serve as a representative of the AppSec team. They help devs understand the Autodesk method, uh, check the progress towards the baseline threat model, and they have a better knowledge of products involved uh, based on the fact that they are in the same area and may even be on a sister team to other developers. Uh, some questions that we still have while developing this program is, do we need to incentivize this person or are they internally motivated? Um, or is it a mix of both? 
What is the ideal duration of the program? And should rotation be expected? Do we need to switch people out? Are they going to get tired? Um, what are we going to do to keep this going? Another challenge that we had was getting delayed responses to our review tickets. And this was another uh, confusing issue to have because a team might put in a lot of work and a lot of hours uh, creating a review and the documentation for us to look at, but then we might not hear back from them on the ticket for over a month in some cases. So we wanted to take a closer look at what was going on. And we found out that actually fear was a big factor that was responsible for the delayed tickets. One, having one-on-one -on -one conversations with these folks that had given a ticket to us but were not responding. Um, people actually said that they were worried they're not qualified for the task or that they're worried about making mistakes. So I'm sure this is something that we can all relate to at times we feel the imposter syndrome or being worried about making mistakes um, because we are dealing with things that are very important. But we found that when re in responding with encouragement or validation and also emphasizing the process as a learning experience, this actually cleared up all of our blockers with these folks within a five to 10 minute Slack conversation. And uh, some examples of things to say uh, that we found very helpful were things like, that's okay, you're not expected to know everything. Uh, this is a learning process and just give it a try. We're here for support. Another example is, it's okay to make mistakes. It doesn't need to be perfect. Um, other folks often go through a draft or two before doing this documentation. Another challenge that we had is the slow adaptation of the CTM checklist. So the continuous process the teams move into after the baseline threat model. Not all teams are doing this, but many more teams have done the baseline review. Well, why is this? Uh, so this actually works best when we're supported by requirements. It's really helpful to have a sense of accountability and uh, it's been very successful with the company-wide requirement to do a baseline threat model. So we want to take this to the next level and complete what we've started with uh, requiring continuous threat modeling. And we've also found that education and accountability and support are key. So one way that we've found to do this is in intro calls. So having a quick 15 to 30 minute call with each team that's about to start continuous threat modeling to explain the process, answer any questions, and also get that commitment from them that they are going to do this with every story. Uh, we also want to start thinking about how to make a progress check. With all of these teams doing threat modeling independently, how do we check our progress and how do we look at what they're actually doing on the ground? Back to you, Izar. Thank you. So apparently we went a bit faster than expected, but <laughs> that just leaves more uh, time for uh, questions. So we, we think that at the end of the day, the methodology itself has value. It's not that we, we went flat on our faces with something that uh, we can't explain why we did it and, and what happened when we did it. Uh, we do recognize that there is a lot of stuff that uh, we have to refine, but uh, there seems to be an answer for every one of the, the problems that we identified so far. Now, uh, we know of at least three places that are thinking about using it or adapting to their needs outside of Autodesk. And uh, apart from the fact that that's uh, by itself, that's uh, a great validation. Um, we're interested in their experiences as well. So we, we hope to at some point get back from, from them something that will help make the, the process better. Um, now, what, one thing that may not have been uh, clear, and now we, we have a bit of time to, to talk about, the whole thing is based on two lists. The 
First one is what we use for the baseline uh, chat model, which is a subject area list. And basically talks about authentication authorization, about defense of secrets, about uh, uh, crypto of content in transit and in rest. So we identified something like 12, 12 subject areas, and we offer to the teams starter questions that do have some value by themselves, but that the target is to uh, initiate a, a discussion in the team that eventually is going to lead either to finding something or to a conclusion that, yeah, everything is okay, or to an aha moment. Now, uh, as Alison said, one of the, the big problems that we have here is basically a, a cultural one. Autodesk is a global company, and we have a lot of teams all over the world. And sometimes we have teams that relate to the subject area list as a, a true or false yes or no questionnaire. So they'll go over the, the answers and just go answering them. And at the end of the day, that's the trap model. So with those teams, we do have to have a conversation explaining that, no, you're supposed to think about what those questions mean in your context and where they're going to take you. So explore them a bit farther. The time needed to create a, a, a baseline is not zero. It's not, not a fast thing. But again, the, the, having people understand that the whole purpose of the, the method is to be evolutionary, meaning your threat model today has to be better than the one yesterday. But it doesn't have to be everything. It doesn't have to be this golden thing that's going to answer all your questions. Um, and letting them fail, letting them ask questions. Having a Slack channel where one of us is probably most of the, the time there is at least one of us in there where we can answer questions and where people have at least something to record the fact that they have a difficulty and we can go back to that and people can go back on history and look at what other people asked. Having that place to safely discuss everything related to threat, to threat modeling turns out to be an extremely uh, valuable, not only educational tool, but a time saver because people do go in there and check out what other people experience before they, they ask their own questions. Now, the second list that we have is uh, a checklist. And we call it the secure developer checklist. But it is a bit different than your normal checklist. A normal checklist would have factors like, you're trying to land this plane. Are you in the right speed? Yes. Did you lower the landing gear? Yes. Did you lower the flaps? Yes. OK, then go and land. The one that we are using has a format of if this, then that. So on one of the sides, on the if this, we wrote developer language. So one of the items, for example, is have you created another actor or have you created another process that interacts with your system? And then on the other side, then do that. That's where we start using security language, but not overly. So we do give the, the developer an entry point to more documentation, but only if they need. So we ask, OK, if you created another actor, have you taken list privilege into account? Have you exercised the right mechanisms for authentication authorization? Stuff like that. So if they need, they have a rope to go and find more detail on how to do that. But if there's something who has experienced that a couple of times, then they are able to just say, yes, I did, and go to the next item. The, Checklist itself is extremely short. We aimed to have something that if you print, will do front and back of one page. And the idea here is that after they use it a number of times, they are able to just chuck it out and say, I don't need this anymore. The intent here is to create muscle memory. So those two uh, checklists, they are the, the main uh, educational content that we base on uh, the, the method on. And they are the main uh, spine that people can hang on to, to actually work with the methodology. Uh, apart from that, the reliance on a, a bug repository to pass the tickets not only gives us the ability of uh, looking backwards in time and extracting information from what people have found to get to those conclusions of, OK, what, what is the most popular finding? Where, where are we failing? But it also gives us a, a good way to interact with the growing threat model and see that there is actually a speed in there 
we are able to look at the team that has committed to the CTM and say, hey, you guys haven't, haven't labeled any ticket lately. Is everything all right? Is, do, do we have a problem here? Do you, do you need more help? Or on the other hand, we can see people finding the same thing again and again and again. We can go and talk to the product team and try to, and time, try to improve that in some way. Try to find a systemic solution. Try to uh, suggest uh, some other form of addressing the problem and that won't lead to that repeating itself again and again. Um, using a bug repository, of course, that's developer language. They know it. They are used to passing information that way. They uh, not only talk to us through bug repositories, but with QA and uh, the DevOps and the documentation people. And this is the whole public beyond the developers themselves that needs to have access to this information. So all of a sudden, instead of having one place where everybody is expected to know that there is this thing called a threat model and go there and consult, consult it, they now have uh, a very um, natural way of finding information which they already use for other things. So they don't have to learn yet another channel. They don't have to build yet another uh, routine of going to check information over there. So a couple of uh, references. Uh, as we said, we open source the whole thing. So feel free to go there to, uh, to GitHub and uh, see the documentation, see the, uh, the supporting material. And, and definitely, if you have any suggestion for corrections or addictions or anything, please uh, do talk to us. Uh, there's PyTM that uh, those in, uh, in Jonathan's uh, talk this morning saw a bit of it. It's this uh, Python-based tool that we have developed with other uh, people to uh, create threat models. It does all the graphing. It now supports something like 100 different threats based on uh, characteristics of the, the system modeled. Uh, small shameless plug, and believe me, it's the first time that I'm doing this. <laughs> so yeah, at around April, we are publishing a Riley book on threat modeling talk a lot about CTM as well. I'm uh, doing it with uh, the great Matthew J. Coles, my uh, partner in crime. We are having a lot of fun with it, but we are still accepting feedback and suggestions. So if you have access to Riley Safari, the three first uh, chapters are already there. Please uh, let us know if there's anything that uh, you think should change or any other suggestions. And uh, Autodesk is hiring for security. So... <laughs> If you guys want to join a great team doing a lot of great stuff, that's the place to go look for uh, what we have open. Speaking of a great team doing great stuff, we have most of our team represented right here in the second row. Those, those five, yeah. Couldn't have done it without you, Esme. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right, questions. So, I don't know if you addressed it, that was the first thing that I spoke about, I mean. Oh. Come on. If you, if you had just been here in the beginning, come on. There's always one. It's Trevor. So, <laughs> so because the communication is based mostly on uh, off-sync or, or uh, uh, asynchronous channels, the bug repository, the Slack channel, uh, we sort of break that model a bit. Of course, it slows things a bit having most of our team in the, the US and having teams on the other side of the world. But again, we, we find that it's an extremely uh, effective way of communicating because not only you have the things there in front of you, but uh, you have the history as well. So even though, of course, it's not uh, mm, ideal not to have somebody right there that can answer, but we are trying to, uh, to answer that with the TM Ambassador program. And, uh, since I'm talking about the DM ambassador, uh, has to be said that the idea for ATM ambassador actually came from uh, Robert Holbert, and uh, props to him for coming up with that one. <laughs> actually, would you like to talk a bit about the workshops? Oh, the workshops, right. Yeah, so another way to scale education is obviously presenting and uh, doing workshops, classes. Um, we did it at an internal event, um, doing several sessions of those workshops. Um, a whole team can come and go and then do it, do like a hands-on exercise with us. Um, so that's at least one whole team that can go talk to sister teams and spread that. Um, so that helped a lot too. We're also looking into doing more workshops coming up. 
And, and that's like one uh, ongoing discussion that we have. Is it better, when you do the workshop, is it better to use the system's product or the, the, sorry, the team's product, or is it better to bring something ready from our side for them to work on? And there are clear pros and cons on each side. And how do you do it remotely? Yes, and how, at, at some point, you do have to, to do it remotely. You just can't fly everywhere. And... Would you want a ton of uncovered attack surface and a bunch of findings coming out right before you try to release or, um, you know, in some other review. I mean, we see some crossover between different um, methods like pen testing. Um, sometimes we'll see same findings or sometimes we'll see that those findings are then remediated after the threat model and then the next pen test is better. But that, that's actually a, a more complex question. Who here is not threat modeling right now? Or in the place where you work or whatever? Threat modeling is not being done. Cool. I mean, it's kind of putting people on the spot, too. Huh? No, 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 seriously. We could do like an anonymous poll. <laughs> I'm still to find the tool, the threat modeling tool that's going to find something that's so conceptual as a business logic bad choice. But just to, to finish that, why threat model at the end of the day? If you guys go through every single one of the many technologies out there, uh, methodologies out there, you will find that the result that you get from a threat model is going to give one clear thing about your product, and that's clarity. Do a bad threat model, do the best threat model, spend a month on it, spend 10 minutes on it, you are going to come out knowing more about the security posture of your threat model than you did before. And that by itself, in my opinion, pays for itself. Uh, before you go into the question, let me just address what you just said. One of the great things that we found is that by passing the torch to the product team, we clear one big uh, uh, hurdle. When the security expert comes through the door and says, now we're going to threat model your stuff, many times people feel that they are under a uh, um, magnifying glass. This guy came in here to critique my design. While we know it's, we're not doing that. We, we are there to make that design more secure. We're not there to look at the design and say, why, why, why? why did you do it that way? We many times do it, <laughs> hopefully to ourselves and not to them. But by passing the load to the product team, what happens is they feel the ownership of the security there much closer to them and much less of a, a, a sword on top of their heads. Like if we find something, hey, we found something, we have an opportunity to actually fix it instead of, oh my God, he found something, now we look like idiots. They don't, that, that's not our intent. We want them to own the failure so that they can get, get better at it, but we don't want to fix their design for them. So we suggest an output report that has the basic information that somebody would need to, for example, if yesterday uh, Allison reviewed a uh, threat model, tomorrow I have to review the new version, all the information is going to be in the same place. So that with 200 plus teams, we don't have to spend time finding stuff if everybody writes their own report. So if, even though we ask people to do CTM, if a team comes up with something that, hey, we did it on a tool, we're going to accept it because the information is there. We're just going to ask them, please put it in a format that's similar to what we're asking so that we can consume it better. But uh, one thing that I think came out quite uh, nicely is the way that we ask people to do their findings. So yeah, we have a unique identifier, we have uh, uh, the CVSS, and lacking something better, and we ask people to actually write a, a scenario, a business case, if you will, for the finding. So that when we are discussing it, or when she's discussing with them one day and I'm discussing the other day, we're actually talking about the same thing. Because they could say, oh, we have a problem between this component and this component on this data flow, and she would see an attack scenario, I would see a different one, we would both in interpret how critical that is in different ways. And nobody would win with that because it would be a tug of war. Yeah. True. So, so one of the things you just said is, is like the context to fitting your form. And I'm, I'm curious about this checklist. Does it kind of have a, a similar categorization that Stride brings with it? Because that's one of the, the benefits of using Stride is, is that I know that this, we're talking about denial of service. Now, your classifications may be 
completely different, but do, do you kind of have that built it in? It is similar in that we do have categorization, but one thing to remember with the Autodesk method is that our questions are questions to lead people into a conversation with their teams to talk about the security posture of their system and learn about it and talk to people in different roles. So I think that the Autodesk method is uniquely positioned to get beyond the checklist. The checklist, as confusing as it is, is not a checklist because it's, it's a bunch of open-ended questions that lead to these conversations. So now you answered my question. <laughs> Yay. Yeah. But the, the interesting thing with Stride, at least in my experience, and, and I know that many of you have experienced something like that. When you put Stride in front of a team, and you say, okay, guys, let's find everything that has to do with spoofing around here. People don't know how to do spoofing. People don't know what spoofing means. People don't know what spoofing in the context of their system means. Yeah. So they look at each other and go, okay, what do we do now? Thank God we have things like elevation of privilege by uh, Adam that uh, put people in that, that context and, and bring them along and, and make the process nice. But the, the, the joke that I always have is, you know what? You can put me in a kitchen and say, think like a chef, but order the pizza at the same time because you're not eating anything. <laughs> So to put a team in a, in a room and say, think like a hacker, it's basically the same thing that you're going to, to, to get, right? Exactly. So I think that Stride was an, a, a very important component in this journey. I think that where we are now, we need something that's a bit more directed, a bit more leading. And uh, as, as Alison said, the, the, the questions that we have are leading questions. Are you doing this thing that we expect you to do? And when they say, no, we are not, that's the point where we can discuss why and why you should. Okay? I had a quick question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Can you speak about um, how you attribute your success to? Is it uh, more organic, grounds up, peer to peer, or was there a top down? You'll have a good um, CTO, CISO, a CIO who mandated this to be a success? Oh. Do you want to take this one? Uh, I mean, it's it's both, right? Yeah. Because, um, you know, we have the support uh, from upper management, and that was a huge part. But we also see uh, the programs such as the Threat Model Ambassador Program working on the grounds. So it's both. I think that the importance of the support from uh, high management comes from the fact that they realized that a threat model is not only this thing that deals with this specific part of the SDL, but that you can hang a lot of other processes on it and use it as an input for other, process, other parts of the process. So QA can use it, DevOps can use it, the deployment guys can use it, and everybody's going to extract something from there. So if you have to have a common line through the whole SDL, a threat model might as well just be it. So um, in regard to uh, your view, right, if you're working if you're working with a development team, their scope is somewhat limited. Their view of the universe is somewhat limited in a software system. So um, how do you deal with looking at the bigger picture as an application security team? As they're not going to unnecessarily understand the full context maybe of all the system or even uh, you know, different components. You know, so uh, how do you guys deal with that, especially given the possibility of having disjoint teams in different time zones? That's a great question, and that is a point of contention that we see all the time with development teams. They're like, it doesn't matter, it leaves my system and it goes yeah. somewhere. And that's just another case of throwing it over the wall. And what happens, we fall over. And it's hilarious on YouTube, but not so much in the real world. So um, we have to sit down and explain, and I wrote some cool default responses whenever I get this question. I just like, here's an essay about why this matters and uh, the approach that we've taken um, with our director um, is to actually have that ticket on both sides. So we're having accountability for the team that consumes um, whatever issue may be from the team that's actually providing a solution. Um, and on the provider side, so that if the provider has to fix something, the consumer actually has to consume that fix. Um, and That's then we know that it's close. The answer to one close. facet of the question, right, which is we should 
should have contracts, right? Yep. Okay. What about, for example, infrastructure, right? So one thing that development teams may not see, I don't know if yours is involved directly with infrastructure, different teams may have different people making them up in, in a sprint team. Yeah. <coughs> However, in many cases, the oper DevOps team is totally different from the developer team. And so you still would want, when threat modeling, some context of the environment that you're going to put something into. Mm -hmm. um, maybe you can address that a little bit so too. So that, that's part of what I see the, the beauty. I, I'm, I'm happy that you brought up contracts. Uh, Brooke Schoenfeld uh, writes a lot about security contracts and the importance between both uh, uh, parts of, of the same system talking to each other, but mostly parts of different systems. So CTN is a good place to start identifying those contracts or the need for, for them uh, because basically uh, now you have that view from two different parts and they are talking the same language. They are asking the same questions. So that's the time that we saw already people identifying uh, things that the system down the line should be doing. So let's go and talk to those guys or at least look at their threat model and see if this thing that we expect is being done or not. Okay, so it, it's, that, that was a great question, thank you. And CTM has shown us that by giving a, a, a common approach and a common language at figuring out what's a problem, these people are talking to, to each other. So it's not going to the AppSec team and expecting the AppSec team to go down to the, other, to the next guy. They are starting to talk between themselves. I yep. think that we are out of time. Well, uh, I'll be glad to, to talk to you guys offline, but I think that we're out of time. Thank you very much. Thank you.